To say being a Paper Mario fan has been an absolute roller coaster for years with no end in sight whatsoever would be an understatement. Coming into this video, you already know that the Thousand Year Door is going to be part of the conversation somewhere. And yeah, it is hard to talk about anything with this franchise without some group of people yelling those four words at you trying to prove a point. Reception to the Origami King upon its reveal was definitely a lot more positive than Color Splashes, but that opinion with TTYD, for many, still stands. Though, to be honest, getting a new Nintendo game announced randomly on Twitter during a time where the world is currently made of bricks, then yeah, you know, that is enough to get anybody super ecstatic. Sticker Star is not good. I'm glad I can finally get that hot take off my chest. The reality is, the Paper Mario franchise has been going in this weird direction for most of its life now. When you consider Super, which is also not a traditional RPG, we have four action-adventure games and two traditional RPGs. This franchise is not an RPG one anymore. I know that reality may sting, but that's where we are. Now, I really enjoyed Color Splash. I've said this many a times in the past, so I'm not coming into this video with an anti-Paper Mario bias. But with the Origami King, enough time has passed that I want to take a look at the game for what it is, rather than what it isn't. It's easy to get caught up in the moment as soon as the game releases and just start hating on it, and we're not going to be doing that today. We will be discussing the infamous interview questions that sparked a lot of that hate, but we'll get to that. All right, let's see what the Origami King is all about. Already looking at a 10 out of 10. It appears we have a festival gone wrong once again. This time the town is celebrating with origami. But of course, something's not right here. And before long, inside the castle, we see Princess Peach. Looking pretty weird. She's been transformed into origami, and she begins speaking in a very bizarre way. Shouldn't the Mushroom Kingdom unfold? Yeah, no, def definitely not. What of those toads? Shouldn't they be silenced for all of eternity? Okay, on that one, yeah, you make a compelling argument. Okay, so on its own, this is actually a pretty interesting premise. We're already acknowledging that the entire world is made of paper, so having the happy world of normal paper being terrorized by folded up ones that's pretty neat, all things considered. Taking these living characters and folding them up to serve an evil purpose? That's pretty messed up. And if we're gonna forego the idea of brand new species or interesting mix-ups of existing species, then at least having the normal paper be good and the folded paper be bad is something I can totally get behind. And thankfully, on top of that, we finally have someone at the head of all of this evil, King Ollie. The last two titles had their fair share of problems, but relying on Bowser as the main bad guy? That's not interesting in the slightest, I'm sorry. It's something that only the original Paper Mario has really been able to handle super well in my opinion. Ever since that original game, however, having a brand new character to work towards taking down alone makes this adventure a whole lot more compelling. King Ollie is pretty solid. He doesn't really show up too often, but boy, whenever he does, he definitely makes an impact. This also means that Bowser is back to being a side character, which in a Paper Mario game, in my opinion, is definitely where he belongs. I want to see a folded up Bowser as a laptop case. Ollie is also the brother of your new helper, Olivia, which throws some emotional stakes into things as well. That's awesome. Once encountering the evil king for the first time, he fully takes over Peach's castle and surrounds it with a bunch of colored streamers. Whoa, dude, this cutscene, it's actually pretty epic, I'm not gonna lie. We are starting off on a really damn good note here. The series has never really been cinematic before, but I'm totally into this. Aw, oh, look at this, Mario is falling from the sky into a grassland. You see, this is a whole lot more classic Paper Mario than we're giving it credit for. So, okay, fine, it starts off really well, and that's all fine and dandy, but let's get to the main topic that I know a lot of you guys are interested in. The battle system. Yeah, it's pretty good. I mean, come on now, after years of asking for traditional turn-based battles, they gave us a system that literally requires you to make turns. Be careful what you wish for. Honestly, I am a huge fan of what Origami King provides here. Every encounter plays off like a puzzle. Rather than the strategy being exclusively knowing what moves to perform and when, each turn begins with you simply trying to line up a group of enemies in a specific way to properly utilize your boots or a hammer as your weapon. They start off really straightforward, but later on, they genuinely get really challenging, and I am a big fan of puzzles like this in general, so learning how to successfully move everybody around in one 
one foul swoop? I found this super fun. Learning how to effectively do so rewards you with a power bonus, as well as the opportunity to take everybody out before they even have a chance to attack you. So on top of being fun, I also found them consistently satisfying. There's even this one building back in Toad Town that fully embraces the puzzle side of things with this sort of challenge mode. When you have a battle system that's primarily based on throwing puzzles at you, having stuff like this is perfect. I love this. But if it ever seemed like too much and I wanted to move on, well, there's also the option to spend coins to either add more time to your turn, or you get the crowd of toads to come in and help you out, straight up getting most, if not all of the enemies totally lined up for you. But then this gets into the conversation of if these battles are even worth doing in the first place. All you receive from these battles are coins, and before long, you're overloaded with them. So being able to cheese them with the toads, that option is never out of reach. It's all of the different items that you can purchase, specifically the collectibles, that are super pricey. So at least all of that money is worth something if you're into that stuff. And in regards to leveling up, there may not be experience points, but you do get stronger by finding all of these hearts hidden across the world. Whenever you get one, not only does your max health increase, but after so long, you will gain more powerful as well. I'm actually totally fine with this system because a ton of these hearts are optional. Getting stronger ends up feeling like a reward for all of the exploration that you can do. It's a whole lot better than solely relying on more powerful forms of existing moves. Though that is still here. And considering how often I did tap into that massive amount of money that I earned, I would say this provides a stronger incentive to battle than the few games before it where they did feel totally pointless. This is easily the best battle system since the Thousand Year Door, at the very least. Also, all of the different battle music throughout the game are absolute jams. It was worth battling just to dance a little bit alone. But for the boss battles, things take a much more different, well, turn. <laughs> you know, it's comedy. Now, because there's only one enemy to take down, the roles get reversed. We're no longer moving tiles with enemies on them, but specific items and actions that put Mario on a path to perform a move of your choice. It's basically like a glorified version of Choo Choo Rocket, and I am living for this. I was a bit more skeptical going into these battles, especially since the major bosses this time around are just things you can find at your local office supply store for $2, but them, as well as the Velumentals, these big elemental monsters that give you special moves along the way, are able to manipulate the board in unique ways for every single fight, and it's actually really damn clever at times. They require you to go into each and every fight with a different strategy. No one boss feels like another. And that is awesome. This was something those original Paper Marios did well too. While definitely more traditional, each boss in those games had to be tackled in a different way, making those encounters a lot more impactful. And I genuinely feel like the bosses in Origami King are just as good. There's also a story reason as to why office supplies are your main obstacles here, and it's really cool, I'm not gonna spoil it, but it's really, really cool. If you really hate the idea of puzzles being your battle system, then yeah, this entire thing is probably a wash for you. But if you're not against that, then I gotta say, this is great stuff. I love this battle system. And hey, on top of that, for the first time since Super Paper Mario, I guess, some of the bosses are done in real time. It makes for a really refreshing change of pace, and it's also just cool. Ah, oh, wait a second, got one complaint here. Mario's nose is slightly bigger for some reason. Okay, I'm back on the fence with this one. So yeah, I really enjoy the battle system. It may not be everybody's cup of tea, but considering we don't have stickers, cards, real life objects that are required to take down certain bad guys, it is infinitely better than anything we've gotten in the last, like, what, 10 years? It's pretty good. The battle system was arguably one of the most controversial parts about this entire game. Outside of that? Yeah, man, it's, it's pretty fantastic. Okay, first and foremost, yes, you can pet the dog. I figured we should get that out of the way. Oh, and also, yes, this is in fact an Eric Andre Let Me In reference. Let me in. Let me in. Yeah, man, why not? It's really best to consider these newer Paper Mario games as adventure games rather than pure RPGs. And with that context, Oh man, was this game ever a blast. All of the worlds are so varied and brightly colored. The soundtrack is genuinely one of the best Nintendo's produced in years. 
Dude, the Sniff City theme has been stuck in my head for weeks and it won't go away and I don't want it to go away because it is so good and catchy. And the most important thing of all, the moment to moment gameplay is consistently engaging with these holes that you can fill with confetti, toads all over the place with funny little quips upon their rescue. And while the game does for the most part put you in that typical linear fashion, pushing you into the obvious direction you need to go to progress, there are also a few proper dungeons that feel almost Zelda-esque with their design as well as a couple of wide open areas that are all about exploring at your own pace and solving puzzles within, which were easily some of my favorite moments in the entire journey. Yes, the Thousand Year Door is also super memorable, but let's also not pretend like all of the backtracking that you have to do to succeed is highly engaging gameplay. Okay, sure, we may not be dealing with settings as out there as the earlier games in the series, but these are still some of the most personality-filled locations we've seen since Super. And also, partners are back! Kinda. It's interesting, it's like this weird half-step towards the thing we've been asking for for years, but in practice, it's totally fine. They kind of assist you in battle, but they are mainly there for story purposes, and once they fulfill said purpose, they go away. That feeling of gathering a crew of people from all these locations that you visit and some of them having these really depressing backstories, yeah, that's definitely not there. But simply having somebody with you, even if it just provides more variety in the text that pops up, it goes such a long way. You got Bobby the bob who's great and should be protected at all cost. He really, really should. There's Professor Toad, who's pretty humorous, and he's a big hieroglyphics nerd. And then there's the combo of Kamek and Bowser Jr. Having these staple bad guys on your side, that's pretty great. The thing is though, yeah, those are the only partners in this game. But I'm actually okay with how it was pulled off. Previously, Color Splash really relied on its humor almost to a fault. While the game was definitely hilarious at times, there was nothing really of substance to sink your teeth into. Here in Origami King, we still have plenty of funny haha -ha moments, but not as often. The plot points feel a lot more grounded now, and it makes for an overall much more well-rounded experience. I guess, if anything though, there is no story reason as to why the battle system is the way it is, unlike before where the main gimmick was also incorporated in said battles, but that's hardly a complaint here, it just would have been nice, I guess, to know why am I dealing with rings here. That I don't understand, but it's fun, so I guess it'll be fine. Point being, Paper Mario The Origami King is fantastic, and if you are not so upset about not getting the Thousand Year Door 2 that you can't possibly look past that, then this game comes highly recommended. 64 and Thousand Year Door are still the best in my opinion, but this is definitely up there. And maybe if Sticker Star and Color Splash never even existed, people probably wouldn't be as upset about all of these changes as they actually are. That perspective really changes things. Sticker Star burned a lot of people. Okay, fine. Let's talk about the interview. Kensuke Tanabe, employee at Nintendo for years and producer of The Origami King. He should probably keep his mouth shut to be honest. After the game's release, interviews are starting to show up online that gave some insight into the game's development, with such classic lines such as, it's no longer possible to modify Mario characters or create original characters that touch on the Mario universe. And coming hot off the heels of the Sticker Star interview that indicated that Shigeru Miyamoto wasn't all that interested in having a compelling story, all of this kinda comes off as, despite giving us a really damn good game with the Origami King, they still seem very tone deaf to the things that people actually want to see. They broke a system that didn't need fixing with Sticker Star, and then fixed said broken system in the two games that followed after. But considering at this point the Mario & Luigi series is also potentially dead, we have a Mario RPG void that has yet to be filled, and I think that's what hurts the most. Wait a second, is that… is that Peach from Paper Mario 64? It's the same exact sprite. I mean, that's cool and all, a good bit of fan service, but… Are we pretending as if those original games didn't happen, or not? Clearly, their current way of going about things is working out totally fine for them. The Origami King will go on to be a massive success, but still, it doesn't really resemble what made those original games so fondly remembered. It's simply the best version of the formula that Sticker Star started. And also, the whole lack of original character thing makes absolutely no sense. Some of the first characters you interact with in the Origami King are tree people that sing to you, so they're not even sticking to their own rules. And you know what games are? 
creating original characters on a regular basis? Actual Mario games. Odyssey was all about that. Why not throw those Toast Arena guys into the desert instead of random Shy Guys? Give us a flying segment with Flygons. Oh man, we can't possibly give existing enemies hats anymore. Come on now. I guess on top of that, we'll also ignore how Goomboss showed up in Super Mario 64 DS as well as Mario Kart DS, but maybe that didn't actually happen, I think I just dreamed it. Honestly, all things considered, the fact that we got the Origami siblings is a miracle. Paper Mario the Origami King is great, but hearing how the game was made just makes me upset. I still highly recommend going on this adventure because it's an awesome time. I just hope the developers finally get around to the whole listening to what the fans want thing. I hear that method also works. I understand and I empathize with the idea that you don't want to buy the game because you don't support the direction the franchise is going. Believe me, I totally get that. But let's be real here. This is Mario. Nintendo's gonna do whatever they want, so you're better off just giving the game a genuine shot and then see how you feel on the other side. Trust me on this. The game is really good. Just don't think about this interview while you're playing the game, because then yeah, then you'll get really mad. But now I can't help but think about the potential future for this franchise. There aren't that many paper cliches left. We got stickers, we got colors, origami, office supplies. What else can we possibly milk out of paper? Got it. So remember how back in school, back when you were really young, you would wad up pieces of paper and then spit it through a straw? I got it. Paper Mario Spitball Showdown. You heard it here first. Nintendo, I hope you're hiring.